Take a moment to say to our brothers and sisters at our South Street campus and our Mill Creek campus who are joining us uh, via video, we're glad, grateful and we're glad that you're with us this morning as well. I have the privilege uh, of introducing to you our special guest preacher uh, for this morning. And I could tell you about uh, the fact that he's a world-renowned C.S. Lewis scholar, and he is. But we don't have time for that. I could tell you the fact that he's a published author, and he is. We don't have time for that. I could tell you about uh, how, how, that he's a pastor and professor, and he is, but we don't have time for that either. So I'm just going to tell you something different. Every one of you has someone in your life when you think, you don't even have to think about how they've influenced you. They just influence you without you thinking about it. You know, you know what I'm talking about? People that you find yourself reflecting on things they've said and done almost in, in your subconscious. And that's certainly true about Jerry Root. I love Jesus more, not just C.S. Lewis more, but I love Jesus more because of the profound in, impact that Jerry Root has had on my life. And so let's take, give a warm Chapel Street welcome to Dr. Jerry Root. I can tell you that I saw Jeff Frazier pick up a house one time on a mission trip. It's true. He'll deny it, but he's a pastor. If you press him, he has to own it because pastors are supposed to tell the truth. I could also tell you that of the three favorite preachers in the world that I love to hear, Earl Palmer, John Ortberg, and Jeff Frazier. I can tell you, I can tell you that we have history together. I have on my locker, I mean in my, my uh, file in my office, a picture of him as a sophomore in college holding my son Jeff in his arms, who's now a pastor also, but Jeff was only about two or three at that time. And I love him, I pray for him and his family every day, and I am just grateful to be here with you this morning. Now. I know that if I'm speaking at a church pastored by Jeff Frazier, I have to have a C.S. Lewis quote. So <laughs> I thought I'd maybe start with one. Um, Lewis said, you don't use, an, you, you don't look at an author as if he's a spectacle or you're going to make a spectacle of him. You use the author as spectacles and try and see the world that he sees. And Lewis, the world he saw was centered on Christ. Just before he died, he wrote a letter to a little girl in America. She was 11 years old. And in that letter, almost the last thing he penned, he said to her, this man on the threshold of eternity talking to a young girl on the threshold of her life here on earth, if you continue to love Jesus, nothing much will go wrong with you. And I pray you may always do so. And I think that's a wonderful word, and we can start there now. The passage for this morning, I'm going to be reading one verse from Philemon, verse 6, from the NIV 1984. I've translated the verse myself. I think this is the best of the English translations of this particular verse. I pray that you will be active in sharing your faith, so that you'll have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ Jesus. The phrase full understanding is one word in the Greek, epigonosko. It's the most intimate word for knowledge in the New Testament. There's a level of intimacy that we will miss out on in our Christian life if this thread is mo missing from the fabric of our life. And I want to speak about that this morning. But first, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, it's remarkable to me that we can gather under one roof and each of us come here with different tugs and pulls on our heart, some full of joy, others full of challenges, some with sorrows. How could we ever believe that one person could stand in front of a group of people like this and think that there could be anything that would connect with everybody? It's just nonsense from a human perspective. And I feel like my offerings are not much more than crumbs. But one day Andrew brought five loaves and two fish to you, and it wasn't much more than crumbs for the 5,000 that needed to be fed. And your son took it and blessed it and broke it and multiplied it, and everybody left satisfied. I pray your Holy Spirit would take the crumbs offered here this morning and that each heart here would hear something that connects with what's going on in their world right now. For that to happen, we need something supernatural to occur. And with anticipation and expectation, we ask that you would meet us at that place. And I ask this in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. 
Paul's writing here, and he basically says there's going to be a level of growth that will occur in our life if we share our faith. How's that so? Um, I think, number one, we're going to grow because people will ask you questions if you share your faith. Let me see if I can put it in context. I grew up in South Central Los Angeles. Uh, it was, it was a, st a stupid time in my life in the, in the sense that I used to take a gun to school. I don't think my frontal cortex was fully developed yet. My mother found the gun loaded between the mattresses, and she's looking at it. She thought it was a starter pistol for track, and she pulls the trigger and blows a hole in my mattress and so on. And, 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 and she called me up and thought I, telling me she thought I was going to go to prison and all that sort of thing. And then she gave me back the gun. Would you give the gun back to your 17-year-old boy? She was just a little bit uh, uh, you know, off balance at that particular moment. But nevertheless, why, I, I, why was I living this wild life at that period of my time? I grew up in a church. And I was told in a church that, if, that if, I, if I went to a movie and Jesus came back while I was in the theater, I'd go straight to hell. I, I desperately wanted to see Walt Disney's The Shaggy Dog at that time in my life and didn't know if it was worth risking my eternal destiny to go see. And the neighbor lady, Mrs. Greenlee, came down and asked my mom if my brothers and I could go with her boys to see the shaggy dog. I'm looking at my mother with ambivalence. I want to go on one hand, scared stiff on the other. And when my mother said yes, I began to wonder if she really loved me, that she would put my life in such <laughs> eternal peril. And I deduced as a boy, if I could lose this relationship with God based on what I did, I had to gain it based on what I did. And I knew nothing of the love of God in that equation. The beginning of my freshman year in college, my older brother, who was a Christian, took me to a campus meeting, and I heard the gospel for the first time in my life. And I was so deeply moved by this message that the God of the universe, who knew all about me, still loved me with a love that was not improved by my good performance nor a love that was diminished by my poor performance. His love was the constant. And I don't know a person who's lived a moment of honest life who's not moved by hearing that you could be loved unconditionally. And secondly, I heard that my sins could be forgiven in Christ. And I don't know a person who's lived a moment of honest life who's unaware of the fact that they're messed up. I believe in the high ideal of love, and yet I've had sharp words with people I say I love most in the world. I believe in justice, but there have been times I've been unfair with other people. I didn't mean to be. I didn't set out to be, but I saw that my own abilities as a human being, finite and fallen, were insufficient for this, and I screwed up. And I don't know a person who's lived honest life who's not aware of their need for forgiveness. And then to hear that the God of the universe would be willing to enter into my life and begin to bring order out of the chaos of that life. I heard that message. I took to it like a duck to water. I think honest people will. I don't mean that you might have some conundrum or some trouble and some intellectual thing that you got to get sorted out. That's okay. That happens too. But once the message gets through, it's so moving. And I was so moved by it, I started sharing it with my friends. And you know what I discovered at that time? My friends had questions questions I had never thought of asking before. One of the questions was, if God's good and all-powerful, why does evil exist in the universe? I had never, I confess it, I had never even asked that question in my days before I was a Christian. I've since written a book on it. It's a question that matters to me. But I first heard it sharing my faith. And I said to the person who asked me that, that's a good question. I have no clue. And I went and started digging for answers. And, and I don't think that questions that people ask us when we share our faith are conversation stoppers. They're actually opening the conversation. Because I get to go back to that person and say, I took your question seriously. You matter. You matter to God, and you matter to me. And here's what I've discovered. I don't think we come up with a last word on things. I think these questions are complex, and we can keep growing in our understanding of them. But I think you can have a sure word. A tree doesn't have to give up its interior rings just because it adds more, but if it's not adding more, it's not growing. And I don't want to be stuck in my faith. I want to have a vibrant faith. I want to be like Lucy in Prince Caspian in the Narnian Chronicles when she sees Oslan the Christ figure for the first time on her second trip to, Osl to Narnia, and she says, Oslan, you're bigger. And he says, oh, no, child, I am not. But every year you grow, you'll find me bigger. 
People will ask you questions. You'll start digging for answers, and your faith will grow as you see this thing is glorious. G.K. Chesterton said, I didn't become a Christian because one or two things proved it. I became a Christian because everything seemed to indicate its truth. And that's cool. That's really cool. People will ask you questions. You'll dig and you'll grow. Second, and, and by the way, if you're not sharing your faith, you might not be in the place where your faith is challenged. And I don't think it's bad to have our faith challenged a bit. Matter of fact, I, I have to say this. If you don't have any questions about your faith or any doubts at all about your faith, I think you're delusional. I think you've achieved some level where you think you are omniscient. We're not. I finished my Bible for the 47th time this summer, the whole Bible, and I'm in my 33rd read through the New Testament besides those 47 times reading the whole Bible. Every time I read it, I see something I've never seen before. Do you have that experience? Maybe it indicates that this book really is given to us by omniscience. I, I, I had a seminary prof, he said to me one time, I finished my Bible this morning for the 200th time. I said, Dr. Feinberg, do you ever see uh, new things in it? He says, on every page, on every page. And it seems to me then that there should be a desire to want to grow and understand more. Share your faith, and this will be uh, peaked, and the interest will increase. Second, you share your faith, people will scrutinize your life. Oh, my heaven. Socrates said the unexamined life is not worth living. If you're not examining your life, my guess is everybody around you will feel responsible to do it for you. <laughs> when I was a sophomore in college, I prayed a prayer, Lord, discipline me. Oh, Lord, discipline me. The next three months were the worst months of my life. Seemed like every friend I had in the world felt it was his responsibility or her responsibility to tell me how messed up I was. I've never prayed that prayer since. <laughs> I pray instead, Lord, keep me from a stiff neck. Give me a soft heart and help me to learn vicariously through the mistakes of others so I won't have to go through them myself. <laughs> I wonder if that's not why God gave us all the stories and the scriptures of people who are so messed up and who discovered grace when they started being honest with themselves. I, I knew a man once, he said, I would never put a Christian bumper sticker on my car. If I did, I'd have to drive better. <laughs> if you start sharing your faith, people are going to want to know, are you the real deal? And all of us are short. All of us come up short. So what do you do if somebody points it out? I remember as a new Christian, I brought so much garbage with me. And I tried to share my faith. The guys I played football, you have to take this completely by faith, but I did play football when I was in college. You have to take it by faith now. But anyway, I shared Christ with these guys, and these guys said, we don't want anything to do with your Jesus. Because we see what you say here, and we see the life you're living, and they're incongruous. And I heard what they said. I asked their forgiveness. I said, God, help me in this area to do better. And you know, three of those guys I was able to lead to Christ before I graduated because they saw I took seriously their criticisms. Do not, do not be shy if people point out the incongruities in your life. Be grateful. And, and I think we learn to discover in deeper ways that the gospel really is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And we can go deeper and deeper to see how that power of God to transform exists, not only in our lives, but also it encourages us because when we share our faith with others, we share it with confidence because we know of its transforming power. And that's cool. It's really cool. And the other thing, too, is if you share your faith, you're going to run into all kinds of people who don't want anything to do with Jesus because they've been burned by somebody who claimed they were a Christian. When that comes up in the conversation, say, tell me about that. That sounds painful. And they'll share with you what happened in their life. And when they do, what, what I do is I hear that, I say, that makes me so sad. I'm sorry that you were burned by that Christian. I'm a Christian. Will you let me stand as a surrogate in the place of that person who hurt you and ask your forgiveness? And the reason why I want to do this is I wouldn't want anything to keep you from seeing how deeply you're loved by God. You share your faith, you'll grow because people ask questions. You share your faith, you'll grow because people will scrutinize your life. You share your faith, you'll st start seeing Jesus show up everywhere in your life. 
I have a friend, he's a, he was a pastor. He started a church that grew, and it got very large. And he had a man on his board who he knew was a bright guy, a wise man, and a, an engineer, started his own business. My friend said, I'd never seen his business before, but he invited me to come see his business and, and then go to lunch and talk about church business afterwards. So I went to this guy's plant. He had started the company himself, and there were 500 people employed at that company. My friend said, I, my, my pastor friend said, I couldn't believe the genius of this guy. And not only that, his tenderness of heart. As we walked through the plant, he said, hey, George, weren't you in that bowling league championship last night? How did it go? Did you guys win? Hey, Sylvia, it's great to have you back after your maternity leave. I hope you brought pictures of the baby. Do you need a little more time off? He said, I knew the guy for years at church, but I never really got to know him until I got to know him in his workplace. I hope you see the connection. You can know God for years at church, but you'll never really get to know him in the most intimate of ways until you get to know him in his workplace. We do not take Jesus to anybody. He's already there. He's already there. He loves the people you meet more than you do. And he is already beginning to woo. Jesus said there are people out there who want to know about Christ. You know how I know? Because Jesus said the fields were white in the harvest. He said the problem is there aren't enough people getting excited about participating in that harvest and the joy of it and the fun of it. Now, sometimes nobody's ever told us exactly how we might do this. So let's transition here and think of some practical things that we might do. And I, I think it's, it's pretty easy to just begin with prayer. When I became a Christian, the pastor of the church I attended said, Jerry, if God answered every prayer you prayed this last week, would there be anybody new in the kingdom? If I'm not praying for people around me to come to faith, then I'm probably missing the opportunities that percolate up in the conversation. He also used to say, people who pray see lots of coincidences. So what if I prayed for 10 people in my world, 10 people around me? I, I, I remember sitting at home one time, and it was a Friday. I was off on Fridays in those days. And, 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 and I said, Lord, there's people on your radar screen, and they're not on mine yet. Opened my eyes, and just then the garbage guy pulled up. It was 10 in the morning. And I said, wow, he comes to my house every week. I don't even have to look for him. And I wrote down on my prayer list, garbage guy. The next week, it was a hot part of the year. He came by about 10 o'clock each morning. I went running out there with a glass of iced tea. And it was in the days when they had those trucks where they would walk around the back and throw the garbage in the basket in the back. And he steps around the back, and I'm already there, and he's kind of surprised to see me. And I said, here, you look like you could use a break. You drink the tea, I'll throw the trash. And I'm throwing the trash and kind of watching him out of the side of my eye, and he's looking at this tea. Is this safe to drink? <laughs> and who's this guy? He takes a sip, and then he goes on. And I said, what's your name? He said, Mike. He has a name. I erase garbage guy. I put down Mike. He's known by God. He's loved. And every week I was out there with something hot to drink in the cold part of the year, something cold to drink in the hot part of the year. And, and finally, one day he came by at noon. And I said, Mike, you're a little bit late on your route today. He said, yeah, I had some problems on the route. I said, well, it's near lunchtime. Did you eat lunch yet? He said, no. I said, you want to come on in? I'll make you a sandwich. He said, okay. I didn't know those guys could do that. He came in and had a sandwich at my house. <laughs> and you know what? He changed his whole route and came by at noon every week after that. <laughs> And every week I'd make him a sandwich, and it was in that time I got to hear about how there was a woman in his neighborhood when he was a little boy who loved the children in that neighborhood, and she had a backyard Bible club. And he went to it, and he heard the gospel, and he remembered praying the prayer, but two weeks later his family moved away. Nobody ever followed him up. I got him a Bible, and we started doing Bible study together at lunch every Friday. He started growing. He started going to church, started bringing his wife and his kids to church. They came to faith, and then he got transferred off the route, and I got a new one, Mick. <laughs> and I was able to share Jesus with Mick, and God will always bring people into your life if he knows you're faithful to be sharing. It doesn't always go well. Matter of fact, if you're afraid of striking out, don't play baseball. But if you don't play baseball, you'll never know the joy of hitting a home run. Lord, who else is on my world? My world that's on your radar screen, not mine. And then I got a, a postman came by. Steve, he comes by. He came by every day. I didn't have to go looking for him. Start praying for Steve. I don't know what you do with your post, post guy or post male man, male woman, male whatever. 
My, my guy now, is, his name's Phil, and, and I just say when he comes by, if I'm home, I say, Phil, do you need to use the toilet? I don't know, what do those guys do when they're on their route? <laughs> Jesus said sometimes a cup of cold water would do just a human kindness, opens up doors. And I pray for Phil, but Steve was my mailman back then, and I remember having the opportunity to share with him, and Steve came to Jesus. I said, oh, Steve, you should come to church on Sunday and come over for dinner afterwards. He says, Jerry, I'm divorced. I have my kids on the weekend. It's kind of tough. I, I don't know if I could do that. I said, bring your kids. Our church has great stuff for kids. They'll love it. And he brought his kids. They came over for dinner, and I got to get on my knees next to those boys afterwards and lead them both to Jesus. And it was so much fun. And right now, Mark, he, he's, the, he's the checkout guy at the Walgreens by my house. And I pray for them every day. And you know, how, you know how you could do it? You pray for these people in your world. And I hope you're seeing. These aren't people where I have to go out. Not all of us are going to be Apostle Pauls. Most of us are going to live in a location. And God has strategically planted you in that location. Pray for the people in that part of your world. And, 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 and I, I talk with Mark. And what I do is I'll usually say to a person, you know what? I pray for you every day. I don't say it every time I see them. But I'll say it maybe once every three weeks. And I've had people after months sometimes come to me because they want to unpackage something that's going on in their heart. And all I've ever had as far as a spiritual conversation is just let them know I'm praying for them. And I've got maybe 10 people in my life right now that I'm doing that with. And they don't all come to the place where they want to talk about it at the same time. But there's always somebody who wants to. It's easy. All of us can pray. And on occasion, tell a person, you know, I pray for you every day. I've never said that to a person. Had them say back to me, well, would you stop it? <laughs> Most people are pretty moved that we've prayed for them. Uh, the other thing, too, you could do, it's very easy, is ask public questions. You meet a person. I, I, I was coming back. I was giving some C.S. Lewis lectures in Slovakia. Uh, and, and, and that's a, 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 Forrest Gump would say, that's a whole other place. And they, I was dropped off at the Vienna airport after I was done giving these lectures, getting ready to fly home. And, and I, I got checked in, checked in, went through passport control, and I came to the gate area, and they, they told me the flight was delayed three hours. Well, I love that, you know, because I, I like the anonymity of airports, read a book, that's all fun. All of a sudden, this young woman comes in to the, the gate area, and she's got a lanyard, a name tag, a clipboard, and she's going up to people. It's Vienna, right? So she's talking to them in German. She's writing down things in the clipboard. I assume she's doing a survey for the airport. And sure enough, she comes up to me, speaks to me in flawless English. I'm thinking, man, a little insecure. What am I worrying that she knew I wasn't a German-speaking person? And then... She tells me she's doing a survey for the airport, and I say, what's your name? That is a public question. It's not intrusive. Don't ask intrusive questions. Ask public ones and listen for the answers. She said her name was Allegra. Uh, I'm in Vienna, so it's easy to ask a public question. Allegra, are you from Vienna? She said, no, I'm from southern Austria. With the answer comes permission to go deeper. What brought you then to Vienna? I'm a student. Lots of ways we could go there. Where are you studying? What are you studying? And so on. I said, do you have other family in Vienna? She says, only my father, and he's a bitter man. She didn't have to tell me that, but when she gave me the information, she gave me permission to ask, why is he so bitter? She said, my mother left him to go with her lover to Canada, and he's so toxic, I understand why she left. Wow, do you have other family members? My other brother, and, and we don't get along very well either. And she says, it's worse than that. She's saying all this to me. She's doing the survey. <laughs> and I said, how's it worse than that, Allegra? She said, my, brother, my boyfriend went to Florence to study art for six months and said, wait for him. I waited dutifully. He came back yesterday to tell me that he found somebody better in Vienna. This is a woman abandoned by everybody, feeling isolated, unloved, and alone. I know where the gospel will connect with her. I said to her, 20 minutes we've been talking. I said, Allegra, I know you got to do your survey, but I have been sent here to tell you something. Then she thought I was a plant at the airport to see if she was doing her job properly. <laughs> I said, no, 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 but I have been sent here to tell you something. So she goes through the survey real quick. How long it take you to check in? How long it take you to get to passport control? All the things you would have thought. And then she says, what were you sent here to tell me? I said, Allegra, 
The God of the universe knows you, and he loves you. Allegra, he will not abandon you. He loves you. Allegra, sometimes you have to say it three times for it to sink in. Allegra, he loves you. She burst into loud sobs. Everybody at the, at the gate are here looking over at me as if I'm torturing this poor girl. And she says to me, but I've done so many bad things with my life. I said, oh, he knows about every one. And that's why he sent his son to die on the cross and raise again and forgive you for all of that. And it just came from asking questions, public questions, listen to the answer and go deeper. Any of us can do this, I think. And, 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 and sometimes things fall in our laps unexpectedly, right? Like, 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 like uh, I was on an airplane one time. I was coming back from a theology conference. I had read a paper. And I was sitting by the window, and a guy comes and sits in the middle seat and says, rats, I've got a middle seat. And just then, uh, a guy comes and sits on the aisle seat. And he says, Professor Root. I go, how do you know me? You got the drop on me. I, I, I don't think we've ever met. He says, no, I said, it's your paper you read at the theology conference. So we start talking across this other guy. <laughs> and I turn to him and I say, please forgive me, what's your name? He said, my name's Sean. I said, Sean, forgive us. We, we were at a theology conference. We were just talking a little theology. Please feel free to be a part of this conversation. <laughs> After a minute or two, I turn to Sean. And I say, Sean, are you a spiritual person? He said, I am. I said, tell me about that. He said, I went and studied with a shaman once in Peru. I said, Sean, tell me about that. Don't be put off by any kind of spiritual spark. It says in the scriptures that God will not put out the smoking flax. He'll not break the bruised reed. What is this interest? Tell me about it. He said, I saved up. I heard I could go study with a shaman. I saved up my money. I saved up my vacation time. And I went down to Peru for three weeks to be with this shaman. I said, how did it go for you, Sean? He said, it was the worst money I ever spent in my life. <laughs> What's in it for you, Jerry? And I was able to share the gospel with him. And I said to him at the end, is there any reason why you wouldn't want to trust Christ right now? He said, none. And he prayed to trust Christ. The guy that was sitting on the aisle, he was a Ph.D. student at Trinity Seminary in apologetics. He's used to building the scaffolding for the faith, but he's not used to obstetrics. And he was blowing his mind watching this guy be born again right in front of him. Wow. And you know what happened on the flight back? This guy on the aisle just started loving on Sean and helping him begin the follow-up process. We were able to send some stuff to him. Sean lived in a different city. You want to help follow up if you can. I, I, I want to suggest to you that there are all kinds of people in your world who want to know about Jesus. Uh, let me tell you a great place where you can find them. Right here. Right here. If your pastors gave you a seating chart and told you you had to sit in the same place every Sunday, you'd all rebel. But look at you, you sit in the same place every Sunday anyway. <laughs> what if you became a pastor of your pew? What if you saw somebody who was sitting in your area and you never met him before? Years ago, I used to be a pastor. I'd always go up to somebody I'd never met before. I'd say, hey, I've never met you before. Are you new here? And they'd say, no, pastor, I've been here for 30 years. You know? <laughs> well, then you say, okay, it's about time we met. I'd pray for him all that next week. First thing I did when I get back the next Sunday is go talk to him, call him by name, and let him know I'd been praying for him. But almost the time, I was right. It was a new person visiting. There was a guy sitting over here one time. I went up to him. I said, you look new to me. I was living in Santa Barbara then. If you believe in Jesus when you die, I think you go to Santa Barbara. It's a beautiful place. So I, I, I walked up to him and I said, you look new to me. I don't think I've ever seen you before. He says, I'm not. I said, what's your name? Public question. Robert. I said, uh, Robert, what brings you here this morning? Public question. He's in the building. He said, my girlfriend broke up with me this last week, and my heart is just ripped apart. And I thought if I went to a church, maybe I'd find something. He could have walked in and walked out, and nobody talked with him. I said, well, Robert, do you mind if I share with you the message that's at the heart of the Bible? He said, no, I'd be very interested. And he gave his heart to Jesus right then. And what I did afterwards is I, I, I always take a person, if I've led them to Christ, and I take them to John 6:47. It says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I said, did you believe? He said, yes. I said, what do you have, eternal life? I said, yeah, but it's got some quality to it, not just quantity. And I take him to John 17, 3, 
where it says, And this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. It's a life of relationship with God in Christ. And then I take them to Matthew 13, the parable of the sower, and I show them the four soils. And you know how they are, one by the side of the road, one on the rocky ground, one among the weeds, and one that's fruitful. The mark of maturity is fruitfulness. And I say, which soil would you like to be? I've never had anybody say to me, I'd like to shoot for that weedy one, you know. <laughs> my whole life I've longed to live towards mediocrity. That's my goal. No, they always say I want to be the fruitful one. I say, so do I. How about if we start meeting so we could grow? And, and that's how I set up appointments, to meet with people. And we, we, I started meeting with Robert. And the first thing we did is we talked about, we talked about Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus. The love that Jesus has for us. It, he makes it easy for us. He's the sun, we're the moon. We reflect back to him and to others what we're receiving from him. And we talked about Jesus. And then after a while, we started talking about the importance of being in the word. The importance of prayer, the importance of fellowship, not just showing up at church on Sunday. That's important, too, is worship. But fellowship, the Greek word koinonia, doesn't mean coffee and donuts between big church and little church. Koinonia means sharing of life, removing the pretense, and getting real with one another in Jesus. We talked about giving because we want to cultivate magnanimity in our hearts and not a hoarding self-interest. And then finally, we, I take them out to share Jesus. And I say, listen, I'll share with the first person, you watch. I'll share with the next person, and I'll invite you to tell your story. And then you start the third time, and I'll be here to back you up. And we went up to UCSB campus, and I wish I could say revival broke out, millions came to Christ. You read about it in the news, I'm sure. No, nobody came to Jesus at all. But Robert saw it wasn't so hard. It took away his fear. Perfect love casts out fear. If you're in love with Jesus, you shouldn't be afraid of these things. And consequently, the next week I get a phone call from Robert. And he says, Jerry, I'm talking to my roommate Paul. He's got some questions. I don't know how to answer him. Can I bring him up to your office? He brings him to my office. I'm able to answer the questions for Paul again. I don't think we get to the bottom of these questions, but I think we could get to substantive answers. And he was satisfied with the answer. And I said, Paul, is there any reason why you wouldn't want to trust Christ right now? He said, none. And I could have just jumped in and prayed with him and missed out on a glorious opportunity. I said, Robert, why don't you pray with Paul right now? And I got to watch as my son in the faith led his first son in the faith. And they started meeting and doing follow-up, and they started sharing Christ with people on campus. And finally, six months later, Robert says, I'm leaving. I'm going down to San Diego where my parents live. I'm transferring into UCSD because I want to reach my family and my old friends for Jesus. And he left my life. And I moved to Chicago to teach at Wheaton College. And several years later, I got invited to come and do a week of uh, lectures at Talbot Graduate School of Theology in La Mirada, California, at Biola University. First thing I was supposed to do was have breakfast in the morning with a bunch of seminarians. I pull up in the parking lot in the rental car. Who's getting out of the car right next to me? Robert. I go, Robert, what an odd coincidence. You moved to San Diego. I moved to Chicago. And we both just happened to pull in next to each other in a parking lot in La Mirada. It was at a restaurant called Mimi's. If you've been to Southern California, it's this restaurant. looks like somebody went through and shot it with a foo-foo gun. <laughs> and he said, oh, no, Jerry. It's not a coincidence. I'm here to have breakfast with you. I said, but Robert, I'm, I'm here to have breakfast with seminarians. Wow. Wow. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And you know what? It's the power of God to transform our lives because if we share, we will grow. And I hope you will do this and have fun and joy in the very unique missional ways God wants to use you in the lives of the people around you. Let's pray. Father, this is so much fun. I pray that every person in the sound of my voice this morning will over this next year get to see at least one person come to faith. Give them grace. Help them to grow in the face of tough questions. Help them to grow when their lives are scrutinized. Help them to pray and to be sensitive to those around them and let them see you at work using them for kingdom purposes. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.